Hey everyone, welcome to the Hornet King channel, and in this video, I'll be removing a European Hornet colony from the ceiling of a very scared client's bedroom ceiling. These European Hornets had chewed their way through the drywall, it was all the way down to the paper, and they are sludge and everything was absorbing into the drywall, and it was creating this funk, and the client couldn't tell where the funk was coming from, and of course, he wouldn't expect European Hornets but he ended up finding that there were European hornets flying in and out of his home. He called me and I came to investigate and remove this nest for him. I bring it home and feed it to my animals, my two emus, my 10 chickens, my Rhea, and my squirrel. Here's the video, check it out. I'm the Hornet King and I removed some incredible and insane wasp nests. Towards the end of this video, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be answering your questions that I get a lot in the comments. So stay tuned to the end to get to the answer to those burning questions you've been having. <laughs> oh my god, it's soft. <laughs> <laughs> it's soft, huh? Yeah, it's a little bit soft. The paper is soft. I'm trying to preserve the drywall the best I can, but look at that, see it's already peeling. And I'm trying to be gentle, I don't want to stir them all up before I open the kick space up. Is this exciting or what? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, get ready. Let's see what's coming out of here. Oh, right, don't close it yet. You gotta see what's happening first. There they are. All right, I haven't disturbed anybody yet. Do you want to take a look? Is it what, it's on the drywall? No, it's above it. Oh. I'm just trying to be still because I want to show as much of this as I can. That is a very, very active nest. I'm just talking about how big. It's very active. Got a lot of workers in it. There's a lot of sludge in here, a lot of waste. So this particular species is the European hornet, or Vespa crabro, which is a cavity nest building hornet species. These are not yellow jackets. People will often mistake these for our very big yellow jackets because they have a lot of yellow on them. So what's the difference between a hornet and a yellow jacket? Well, both of them are different types of wasps. So wasp is the family name, and that encompasses yellow jackets, hornets, cicada killers, mud daubers, etc. They're all types of wasps. But when it comes to hornets and yellow jackets, the primary difference between the two are the sizes of the individuals themselves. So yellow jackets are smaller, more slender, depending on the different species of yellow jacket. But hornets are more robust, and they're very, very large. So this particular species, the Vespa crabro, are anywhere from like about an inch and three quarter to two inches long. And they're very, very robust. And they're just a very hardy insect. So when you see them flying around, they look like hummingbirds. They look so big. But they're really not that big. They just are more intimidating. So with yellow jackets, they have a lot more in their colonies. So like German yellow jackets will have about anywhere from like 5,000 to 10,000 in the colony. But Vespa crabro, they'll have anywhere from like 2,500 to 5,000 hornets in the colony. Now this particular colony, this one wasn't the biggest one I'd ever seen, but it was very, very active. There were a ton of workers inside of this colony and a lot that were out foraging. And then the nests themselves were very packed with larva and pupa. So this was gonna be a continuing problem for this client because there's gonna be a lot more hatching out throughout the rest of the season. So when I come to someone's home, they say, you know, I've been seeing a stain on the ceiling. I've been smelling this god-awful smell. I had no idea what was going on above the ceiling. Some people actually check. They'll go and they'll tap on their ceiling. And they'll punch right through the drywall into a very active nest, and they get stung and attacked and everything else. Plus, they release a lot of the wasps into the room. So with this particular client, he just noticed the odor, and he saw the, saw the stain on the ceiling, and he could hear them in there. 
and that's when he went outside and investigated outside and could see the activity flying in and out from the exterior part of his home. So he put two and two together and decided to call me to come and investigate and get the nest out. So I didn't even have to like go into his bedroom fully. I could smell them just walking upstairs. Like it smells like a very sweet, like sewagey smell. So the second I got into his bedroom and noticed a soft spot, and then I was just able to get started and start removing the nest. So I pull out this nest and I try to vacuum up all the workers and things off the comb itself and also the ones that are left over inside the cavity. I did stay here for quite a bit and just vacuum up all the ones that made their way into the living space and all the ones that were coming back from foraging. And then eventually I fixed his drywall and patched it for him and then spackled everything. So all he has to do is just have a skim coat of spackle put on, then he can prime and paint it so then it'll be done. This client was very nervous. If you can't tell in the beginning of this, he was very nervous about these. He was afraid of wasps. So he was very happy that I came out and removed this nest for him. Wayne. Yeah. You want to see it? Mm. Here's your nest. <laughs> oh. Look at that nest. There's still quite a few inside of it, but they're... Oh, my God. Okay. Oh. It's okay. They're right. You're right. You're right. She's gone to the light. There's quite a few up inside this cavity still coming in from foraging. So, all right. Let me get. I gotta get some of the drywall stuff. So I get the nest home at the end of the day. This is a European Hornet Queen from one of the nests that I removed, not this particular one. And I was just able to vacuum her right up. You can tell the queens apart from other individuals in the colony because her colors are much more vivid and more contrasted as opposed to like ones that just hatched or even workers plus she's more robust and much bigger. So I think I did about seven or eight removals this particular day and a couple of them were European hornet nests. So I get them all out and then just trying to vacuum up any of the residual that are inside the bag, maybe some that hatched out on my way home. I can vacuum off all the workers off of a nest, but by the time I get home, there's about you know 40 or so workers that have hatched out of those nests. So. I just go around and vacuum up all the individuals that are inside of there. There's another queen that I just removed, and I think that wasn't an actual matriarch in the nest. I think that was just one of the newly hatched queens. But you can see that these nests are just packed with larva and pupa. So they're very heavy, and it's, it's pretty, pretty dense when you pick up these nests. Even though the comb is a little bit brittle for this particular species, they have a very brittle comb. Um, but when you pick them up and they're, they're packed full with larva and stuff, they're very, very dense. So that's all what I feed to the animals. People ask about, like, well, you know, do you feed the vacuum contents to the animals with all the workers inside of it? No, I do not feed the vacuum contents to the animals. I dump that out of my compost pile, and that gets recycled into the, back into the soil, and then I use it for compost. Uh, but the nests themselves, I take them down and feed them to my animals, my chickens, my emus, my rhea, and occasionally the squirrel. So once I get everything vacuumed up, everything that's live, I put everything back in the bag so that way I can transport it down to the backyard where the animals are in the fence. Take this down with the birds. Queen. European hornet queen. So where have the squirrels been? Where's the squirrel in this video? Why aren't you... You know how many times I get that in every single video? If I don't show a clip of a squirrel, at least 10 people will comment and say, where's the squirrel? So here's the thing. I've had five squirrels over the course of making these videos. The first one was Humphrey. I got her as an infant baby squirrel. A friend of mine from high school said, I found this baby squirrel outside. It's been squealing all day. The mother's not coming back to it. So I figured, how hard can a squirrel be? Well, it is a pain in the butt. <laughs> it's like having a kid, all right? I raised her up to an adolescent, just about an adult squirrel, and then it did a soft release where I put her out in my greenhouse. Meet squirrel, 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 meet squirrel. Ah, the sun beating on your face, isn't this nice? Meet squirrel, meet squirrel. You already got one. How'd you get one already? Hey, squirrely squirrel. <laughs> and then eventually she leaves the greenhouse on her own and then she goes off and forages and explores and she keeps coming back to the greenhouse. 
and eventually she'll be completely released and she'll live out on the hedgerow or out in the woods behind my house. Um, Humphrey was the only squirrel that came back constantly and she actually had a couple litters of kittens in my barn and in my greenhouse, which was really cool. Um, but that's not the plan and that's not the intent when I rescue squirrels is for them to be a pet. Humphrey was just a very special squirrel that she always came around when I called for her and she would eat a lot of the nests when I would put them out for the chickens and things. She was a real star of the channel. Hello, Humphrey Squirrel. Look at those nipples, Squirrelly Squirrel. Hey, Bree. Look at your nipples, Squirrelly Squirrel. You got babies on those nipples, Squirrelly Squirrel. But she actually died like a year and a half, two years ago, maybe. Um, and she, she got some kind of disease. She came back to the greenhouse box and she died in the box. So it was kind of sad, bittersweet. I at least knew that she died. Um, now I had Miss Mamie and Miss Emily, which was Humphrey's daughters. And Miss Mamie had died pretty young. Um, but Miss Emily, I had her for up until adulthood and I released her. She left and never came back. Um, she may have gotten eaten. I don't know. Um, but I always like to think that she just went off and populated the squirrel population down in the woods. Um, and then there was Lady Squirrel, which was really sweet. She stuck around a lot longer than, than say, like Miss Emily, Miss Mamie. Um, but then there was Princess Peaches, and she was the most recent squirrel that I had. And I did a soft release on her. She ended up going out, living on the hedgerow. I actually watched her build a nest up in one of the trees on the hedgerow, which is really cool. She came back for like a month. She would come back and come and go and things. And then eventually I just stopped seeing her. So she may have gotten pregnant and then went off into the woods and had her litter of kittens. I don't know. So every now and then I would see her come back during removals, but I have not seen her for probably two months. So who knows what happened to her? But that again, that's not the goal or the intent to keep her. My goal and intent is to rescue them and release them. Because they're wild animals, you can't keep squirrels as pets. Some people try, they are successful if they like their things chewed up and having this crazy animal in their home. <laughs> I love having squirrels, but I'm not going to lie to you. It, it, it is a pain in the butt to have a live adult squirrel living in, like, say, my studio or my office. <laughs> they chew on everything. They try to make a nest because it's instinctive. So... Yeah, they're not pets. They're they're solely rescues that I then release. One of the other questions that I get a lot in the comments is, do I do honeybees or bumblebees? So I, it's like my life's mission never to do any kind of honeybee relocation or removals. I hate honeybees. I, I mean, I love honeybee. I like all insects, but I hate removing honeybee nests. It is the most sticky, messy, nasty, time-consuming pain in the butt you could ever imagine. Um, the second you go and start doing a removal, you are covered in honey instantly. You're sticky, everything, your tools are sticky, my vacuum's sticky, it loses suction because the tube's getting all filled up with crap. It is a pain, it is a total mess. I don't know how these apiarists do it. I, Randy from 628 Dirt Rooster, how in the world are you an apiarist? How do you do removals day in and day out and wake up every morning and say, hey, I wanna do that again? Give me the wasps. Give me all the yellow jackets and the hornets. I way rather have yellow jackets and hornets. But anyhow, there are times where I do get calls and it's just a matter of, hey, we need these things exterminated because they're X, Y, and Z. They have their own list of things why they need to have them removed. This last summer, I had a client reach out to me and said they had two different apiarist companies come out to relocate this colony and they got both got swarmed and attacked and the one guy, he was only there for 10 minutes. He started vacuuming and he got 50 stings. So he had enough of it. He left. He said, these are Africanized bees. I'm not touching them. They need to be just destroyed. So she contacted me to come and remove the colony. I went up into her attic. It was a 1700s house. It was really super cool. But of course, they had to be up in the attic. And I had to remove some of the stone off the gable and expose the colony. They didn't seem very aggressive to me because I'm used to yellow jackets and hornets. So maybe they were aggressive for honeybees. I don't know but I vacuumed everybody up, took the nest out and then brought it home. And I actually gave it to an apiarist friend of mine who I usually refer all my calls to for honeybees. And she picked up this big trash bag of honeybee nest and she took it out to her apiary yard and she fed it back to her honeybees. And they just went and robbed the nest and took all the honey and took it back to their own colony. So nothing got wasted other than the colony itself. But if it is an aggressive colony, it shouldn't be left around. In case, there, there shouldn't be any risk of there being Africanized honeybees in the area. 
Now, as far as bumblebees are concerned, any bumblebee colony that I come across or someone calls me to remove, I relocate it. So I bring it back to my home or I take it over my parents' woods and relocate it over there. There was one that I actually ended up killing because I wasn't prepared for a relocation. It was kind of like, hey, while you're here, can you remove this bumblebee nest? And I was in the middle of a lot of removals. There was no way this thing was going to survive. So I vacuumed everybody up. I brought the nest back to the house and did a lot of video showing what the bumblebee nest looked like. And there's tons of comments of people saying that bumblebees don't make honey. They absolutely do make a honey. I don't think it's the same honey as honeybees because honeybees, they dehydrate and really kind of control the water content and percentage. And it gets really sticky and kind of thick and viscous as opposed to bumblebees, which is more like glorified nectar. Like it's kind of like watery, but it's still sticky too. You put it between your fingers, you get the string, you know, and I tasted it. And I would say it's probably sweeter than honey. It is really, really good. So you think they're going around to clovers and things like that and going to the clover flowers and it might be a completely different taste than what you get with honeybees. I don't know. A big question that I get often about my animals is what do I do with my animals and what do I feed them over the winter time? Obviously, I'm not giving them yellow jacket and hornet larvae because I'm not removing nests this time of year. So what I have to do is I give them a lot of produce, a lot of store-bought foods. So I give them a lot of like grapes, apples, watermelon, and a ton of spinach. They love spinach. Something else I do is actually grow barley grass. So I get the seeds off like Amazon, and then I grow the grass blades to about nine inches tall, and then I feed that to them. So I do it in my greenhouse, or I do it in my uh, studio down here where it's warm, grow the grass, and then just throw out these like blankets. I wish I had some footage of it, but throw out these blankets of, of grass, basically like sod, but there's no dirt really. Um, throw that out for the animals, and they just love it. Uh, I do have some clips here of the emus and the rhea eating a bunch of grass that I pick. So if I like do weeding around my yard, I can just take those clumps of grass and weeds and take them down to the animals. And the emus and the rhea especially will eat them. They're pretty much omnivores. Like they will eat like protein, like meat and things like eggs. Um, they, I'll feed the chickens eggs back to them. And the emus and the rhea will also eat them. Um, but then I also give them like, you know, kitchen scraps and things. And they'll eat that like chicken and, and turkey and um, other, anything. I mean, birds will eat anything. <laughs> so that's pretty much what I do. Now, as far as I like store bought stuff at my local pet supply, um, I get a chicken feed crumble, which the emus and the rhea will eat. And I also get peanut hearts, which is basically just crushed down and sifted through peanuts, um, where it's actually like pieces of peanuts, not the full peanut. And I'll toss them into a big bowl and the emus and the, and the rhea will eat that for a good protein content. So that's something else that I do and it just keeps everybody fat and happy. Now, the problem with feeding them those kinds of foods is that they're messy eaters. So there's always like cracked corn and chicken crumble and, um, and the peanut hearts on the ground. Well, that attracts wild animals. So I get skunks. I always have baby skunks under my under my barn, they get inside the horse stall and they go underneath the uh, concrete and they tunnel around in there and they, they have babies on it. I was about to say they lay eggs, but <laughs> they have babies under there and then the babies emerge and they're really cute, but I don't want a ton of skunks around in my barn. So I, I wish I could get them out of there. I'm gonna have to try to do like a live trap. What I recently had were rats. Now, it's not like I was afraid of the rats or like the pejorative connotation where it's like they're messy or they're, or they're uh, conniving and they're like tearing things up. It was nothing like that. I didn't even know they were there. And so I started seeing these little burrows starting to form underneath the concrete and these like piles of dirt and stuff. And I was like, who's doing that? Those holes are too small to be a, a skunk, but too big to be a mouse. So I ended up setting up some uh, have a heart traps and I trapped a few rats. I, yep. I, I trapped five of them and they were big, <laughs> big this brown big rats. One. Um, so I actually just relocated them over to my parents' woods. So they'll have another life over there. I just don't want them under my barn. So the other thing I get are raccoons. So I'll get raccoons every now and then. Um, I had this baby raccoon that, that got trapped in the fence and it tried to climb out, but it got light outside and ended up falling asleep on the top of my fence post, which was absolutely adorable. Um, but I don't really care to have raccoons in the barn, obviously, so because um, they can attack the chickens. But the emus and the rhea actually keep a lot of those kind of animals um, out of the way because e emus will stomp out a dog. I mean, God forbid a dog comes into my emu pen and I would hate to see certain dogs that bark all the time. I'd hate to see them get stomped out by my emus. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so the emus are pretty protective of the of their environment. So a lot of animals like hawks and things, if hawks fly over, they go nutty and they'll scare away the hawks. So I don't have to worry about my chickens too much with hawks. But 
But interestingly, speaking of hawks, I had a nest of hawks right on the pine tree next to my house here. And they had babies. And it was like five babies came out of that. And I got to watch them grow from chicks all the way up to young adults. And the mom and dad stayed with them, feeding them and stuff all the way up to young adulthood, which is really interesting. Um, they never bothered my chickens at all. They were Cooper's hawks. So they were a little too small to go after my chickens. Um, and anyway, they were afraid of the emus. <laughs> so, but yeah, so that's the, that's the animals I get around here. And that's kind of how I take care of them throughout the winter time. Um, it is kind of nice to be a part of the, uh, the ecosystem here. They kind of helps even the wild animals. But um, so it's neat to see the variety of animals that come to my property because I feed them the nests or whatever. So, but I thought maybe you guys would enjoy getting the answers to some of these questions you have. So if you guys have any other questions, you got burning questions you want to know the answers to about either what I do here with wasps or what I do as far as my animals are concerned, drop in the comments. I'd love to do more of these interactive type of videos and just address the things you guys have questions about and anything you're interested in. Hey, birdies. Hey, sweetie booty. Oh, that's Doris. Hey, sweetie booty. Hey, Doris. Hey, Doris. Tell Sweetie's enjoying how she gets on her knees like that. Oh, wee the wee. Oh, wee the wee. Sweetie booty. Is that appropriate? Well, enjoy birdies. Peach's squirrel came back for a visit. She's been living wild life on the hedgerow. Oh, really big queen. So she came back for some almonds and peanuts. We've been giving her some snuggles. She's been enjoying the fruits of my labor. <laughs> Maybe I'll bring a nest down. I've got a nest she can nibble at. We'll go grab that quick. Come on down here, squeal. Come eat that squeal. 
Come nibble it, squeal. Go ahead and nibble it, squeal. Come nibble these, squeal. Here you go. Take which squeal. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to check out this video. If you guys enjoyed this content, drop in the comments. Let me know what you think. If you have any suggestions for future videos or something like you see me cover in an upcoming video, also drop in the comments. Let me know. I wanted to let you guys know that I got more t-shirts. I have youth mediums, youth large, and then adult small, medium, large, extra large, and 2X. So if you guys would like to have a Hornet King t-shirt, which I'm not wearing right now. <laughs> I'm wearing my Zelda Pride sweatshirt, which has got bleach, sun bleach all over it. But if you guys would like to have a Hornet King merch t-shirt, go down to the video description here, donate $25 to my PayPal, and then I'll ship you a t-shirt. But make sure you specify which size you want, because I do get a couple people donating, but they don't specify if they want a t-shirt or if they want a certain size. So there's nothing for me to send them. And even when I send emails, no one replies. So please specify if you want a t-shirt or if you're just donating the channel, which is greatly appreciated. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to check out this video and supporting my channel, and I'll catch you on the next video.